Hey, hi, if you can, please turn in your Bible with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. You can also find it on the YouVersion app, otherwise known as the Bible app. You can find the scripture there as well as all the notes. Wherever and however you're joining us today, please know that you are loved by all of us here at Life Church and more beautifully by God, our adoring Father. Friends, I'm so excited to launch a new series here called Becoming Jesus People. It's such an important series because sometimes we just take for granted what we're supposed to be doing or what that looks like or what the path is. So I like that we're going to take a few weeks and figure that out. If you're the sort of person who skips to the end of a book before reading it so that you know how it ends, I can save you the trouble and tell you that the way to become a Jesus person is to become as much like Jesus as we can. It sounds simple, but it isn't very easy. That's why we're doing a sermon series to help you find that groove. At Life Church, we use the term Jesus people on purpose. It seems like the label of being a Christian has been hijacked in many circumstances in today's world. It's been politicized. It's been leveraged to spew hate and protest against our neighbors. It's been appointed a socioeconomic value. It's often misunderstood and misrepresented. I've said in the growth track class that the label of being a Christian comes with baggage that I didn't pack. I can't answer for the crusades or the inquisitions of the church in the middle centuries. I don't understand how the church in the in like in America stood by and watched slavery grip America or how the church in Europe watched the exterminations of Jews in the last century. I don't understand what the Westboro Baptist Church and all their hate and, 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 and ugly protests of, of everything. I don't know what that all means and I can't account for it. And that's how many people in and out of the church understand Christianity. But Jesus? Yeah, I'll answer for him. I'll continue to understand him more. I'll agree with him. So I'm a Jesus guy doing this Jesus journey with my Jesus friends, Christ-loving, Christ-following, Christ-want-to-be-more-liking, a Christian to be sure, but only in the most Jesus-centric way. So we're going to take a few weeks to talk about becoming Jesus people. One of the best texts in the Bible of understanding who Jesus wants us to be can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew, Jesus lays out exactly what it takes to live a life worthy of being regarded as a Jesus person. We're going to discuss the very beginning of that sermon, the Beatitudes, in part one of Becoming Jesus People. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, ma'am, we love you so much. I love you so much. I thank you, God, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that in your word I can find the way, that that's all I need in life, God. That's, that's the only directions that I need to find. And so thank you for that. And thank you for the patience and the grace and the mercy that you extend me every day as I try to figure it out. Every day when I stumble, you pick me back up and we keep going together. And I thank you for being that kind of loving father. Be with us for this message, Lord God, and like have it like written on our hearts and written on our minds so that it's ever present on our lips and in our actions. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're all pretty familiar that there is something at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. Not many of us, however, have a deep understanding of what Jesus was trying to say and why it was important enough to kick off an entire sermon with. Lots of us just start with a punny dad joke or something, but Jesus, he jumps right in and throws his followers, the listeners, a curveball on the first pitch. Here's how it reads in the King James Version. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're anything like me, this is a part of scripture that's been too cumbersome to focus on. I kind of blew by it, assuming that all eight or nine were essentially, blessed are people for whom life stinks right now, because then they'll get something better later. And if I'm being honest, <laughs> I thought that right up until I started doing research and preparation for this message. The word beatitudes comes from the Latin word beati, which translates to blessed. 
It's the same root word for the term beatification, which is one of the steps of sainthood in the Roman Catholic tradition, somewhere after death and veneration. As we'll see when we work through each of the Beatitudes, the word here, blessed, is most accurately understood as happy. So happy are the poor, happy are the mourning, happy are the meek, happy are the hungry, etc. For Jesus, this wasn't a new way of saying things. It's a context that most of his audience would have been familiar with. The great Psalm book of Psalms starts with much the same way. It says, blessed is the person who obeys the law of the Lord. They don't follow the advice of evil people. They don't make a habit of doing what sinners do. They don't join those who make fun of the Lord and his law. Instead, the law of the Lord gives them joy. They think about his law day and night. We're not going to be able to get through all eight Beatitudes in the time that we've got together now. So I'm going to cover the first four, and our friend Pastor Sean, he'll teach on the last four next week. So let's get started. The first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the NIRV version, the first beatitude reads like this. Blessed are those who are spiritually needy. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. In biblical terms, being poor or needy in spirit means that someone has a poverty of arrogance. So we're already a little upside down in how many of us have understood this passage. Eugene Peterson in the Message Translation calls this being at the end of our own rope, at the end of ourselves, bankrupt, empty. To be poor in spirit means to be unable to rely on ourselves, unable to rely on our effort, our position, our strength, our abilities. To be spiritually needy means a complete absence of pride and complete absences of self-assurance and self-reliance. Well, I mean, this is contrary to everything the world tells us. Everything we tend to believe about ourselves. I've got this is the mantra most of us live by. The more we can do on our own means the less that we need to rely on anyone else. That's how you get stuff done, or so we think. But our abilities, they only get us so far. We're limited. I'm limited. Look at you, you can do all I couldn't do, Glinda. I don't do that nearly as well as Sean does, but that's from Wicked. It's one of my favorite songs. Anyway, listen, there's an end to us, an end of what we can do. It wasn't always that way. It started much differently for Adam and Eve. They weren't limited. God wanted us to be unlimited. He created us to be unlimited. And we could have stayed that way if we could have just been obedient. Well, one of the consequences of our disobedience is this limitation. So even when the world tells us to express yourself, believe in yourself, realize the powers that are innate in yourself, self-confidence, assurance, self-reliance, there's only so far we can take ourselves. And the truth is, it's a really short road. In this beatitude, Jesus is telling us to forget what the world tells us to tell ourselves and instead understand that compared to God, in the presence of God, we're not rich in talent and self-worth, but flat, broke, and busted. Many of our heroes in the Bible understood this principle deeply. When God called Gideon, he responded, no, no, this is impossible. Gideon says, I belong to the lowest tribe, and not just that, the lowest family in the lowest tribe. Moses felt deeply unworthy of what God wanted him to do. David said, who am I that you should ask me? Isaiah claimed to be a man of unclean lips. Peter rebuked Jesus' calling. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I mean, even Jesus didn't claim the prerogatives of his Godhead. Once he said, I can do nothing of myself. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, What I say isn't said on my own. The Father who lives in me does these things. And even earlier, he says, I can do nothing by myself. I do not try to please myself. I try to please the one who sent me. And while this is true of how we live out our lives, it is especially true in how we work at our salvation. One of my favorite movies from the 1980s was called The Name of the Rose, starring Sean Connery and a very young Christian Slater. It's based on a novel by Umberto Eco, and the setting is a Benedictine monastery in northern Italy during the winter of 1327. It features all the typical monastic place settings, solitary and silent, self-punishment like flatulation and hair shirts and just general discomfort. The monastic way seems to include the notion that there is much that we can do on our own and unto ourselves to make us worthy of God's love, grace, mercy, and the gift of salvation. But here's the thing, 
the more you try to contribute to your own or complete your own salvation, the more conscious you are that you yourself are doing it and the less poor in spirit you will be. The answer is that you do not look at yourself or begin by trying to do things yourself. Look at Him. Focus on God. The more we look at Him, the more hopeless we feel that are left to our own abilities and resources. We need to become bankrupt of pride and becoming poor in spirit. The second one. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Or, blessed are those who are sad, they will be comforted. In the first beatitude, we learn that we have to empty ourselves of ourselves so we can give God space to work in us and for us. If we believe what we're told about the meaning of blessed, this second beatitude tells us that happy are those who are sad. <laughs> well, I mean, happy are those that are sad. That, that don't make no sense. But once again, there's a difference between what the world tells us to do and what Jesus tells us to do. And it's all the difference in the world. The world says, never mind your problems, forget your troubles, cheer up, buttercup, and don't apologize for being you. Just do what makes you happy. But here's the thing, the world offers nothing for sustainable happiness. Momentary happiness, yes. The world offers an endless parade of fleeting happiness. It's a happiness that only lasts until the high wears off, until the bottle is empty, until the Amazon packages arrive, until the fling is over, until the Oreos are gone, until you lose your winnings. Now, sustainable happiness, or joy, that's achievable, but not by using the world's recipe. It can be found in many pe Jesus people right now. You can see it in them, you can see their joy. You see it in how they carry themselves, how they treat others, and how they approach life. It's a condition that is easily perceptible, but not easily replicatable. And I'm gonna tell you the secret, sin. First, let me tell you that you're a sinner. If it's good news, I'll tell you that I'm a sinner too. I'm pretty sure Sean's a sinner, Sonny too. We're all of us sinners. And please hear me when I tell you that sin isn't limited to the 10 rules that Charlton Heston brought down from Sinai with his glowing face. As Pastor Sean has told us, sin is anything that God wouldn't do. I'd bet you dollars to donuts that you've already done something today that God wouldn't have done. Sin isn't just thieving and killing and lying and disrespecting your mom. It's pride and jealousy and greed and enmity. Heck, spend 15 minutes on the Facebook and you'll collect a pocket full of sins. If you're doing something that you don't want your mom, your spouse, your boss, or your kids to know about, ask yourself why. If you're watching something you'd hate to be caught watching, say something you'd hate to be caught or heard saying, thinking something you'd hate to be broadcast for the world to see, ask yourself why. Our sins are our way to fulfill a need or desire we have on our own terms. There's a lot of us and we and our in that statement. Oftentimes we pursue sin, we decide on sin because we'd rather operate outside of God's will, God's timing, or God's plan. We don't want to do the work to find joy in a life with Him, so we'll settle on making ourselves happy for five minutes at a time. And then we turn around and ignore the conviction we feel about our sin because the world tells us we deserve to be happy right now. We've earned it. We deserve it. I'm telling you to consider exactly what we've earned and what we deserve. When Jesus tells us that blessed are those who mourn, he's talking about those who mourn for their own sins. Are you mourning your cruddy decisions and habits and secrets? If you're not, why not? If you are, what are you doing about it? St. Paul said there's plenty that he does that he hates. Do you hate those things that you do, watch, say, or think? I've got more good news. If you hate those things, if you find yourself hating those things earnestly, the Holy Spirit, the friendship of God, is present and moving in your heart. You are filled and being led by the Holy Spirit. What you're feeling is conviction, and it's holy, you guys. Allow it to move in you, to change you, to convince you to try even harder to avoid doing those things tomorrow. Allow God to forgive you. That's the comfort that Jesus promises. The blessing isn't in the morning, it's in the comfort. The comfort of the blessed hope and the glory that yet remains. Number three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Or, blessed are those who are humble, they will be given the earth. The folks who worked for King James called it meekness. Today, we think of it as humility. 
Neither one is particularly embraced by the world. In our culture, we celebrate success that's achieved through conquest and possession. The more you assert yourself and express your demands, the more you focus and manifest your powers and ability, the more likely you are to succeed and make your mark. Meekness and humility aren't really part of that equation. But meekness and humility are at the heart of God's equation for success. Once again, let's look at some of our biblical heroes. I think about Abraham, right? When he goes with Lot and he like gives Lot first dibs and first choice on the bigger piece of land or whatever. I think about Moses who forsake his princely power and glory as an Egyptian prince and son of a queen or something. And he gave it all up, right, to follow God. I think about, I think about David. He served Saul, knowing that Saul was a horrible dude, and knowing that he was the next king anyway, that God had already chosen him. I think about Paul, who had ministered to those who had forsaken him, that had beat him, to those who that were punishing him constantly, that he ministered despite his suffering. I think about Jesus and his reaction to other people, his suffering, his attitude towards his enemies, but perhaps still more, his utter submission to his Father. Like the Beatitudes that have come before, we see again here that the work of becoming a Jesus person begins with emptying ourselves of ourselves. That doesn't make us less. It allows God to make us more, more than we could ever be on our own. But like the old Westerns say, your spirit ain't big enough for the both of you, you and God. Someone's got to go. If you kick God out, you limit what you'll accomplish in this life and throw away any hope for the next life. Side note. The life clock's in at around 85 years. The next life, no clock. But if you give God your life, you'll find that he's able to do so much more with you than you ever can. Plus, there's the whole eternal life thing. It's unfortunate that meek and weak rhyme because people tend to think that it means the same thing when in fact they couldn't be further apart. Meekness and humility are qualities frequently manifested by exceedingly strong people who do not use their strength or power to crush over others or step over slash on them to get ahead. That's what a Jesus person looks like. Listen to what the renowned Welsh minister D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says about Jesus people. The Christian is altogether different from the world. It is a difference in quality, an essential difference. They are a new person, a new creation. The Christian belongs to an entirely different kingdom. And not only is the world unlike them, it cannot possibly understand them. The Christian is an enigma to the world. And if you and I are not, in this primary sense, problems and enigmas to the non-Christians around us, then that tells us a great deal about our profession of the Christian faith. Come on. lloyd Joe says that we should be so flagrantly humble and meek that the world won't know what to do with us. It won't know how to categorize us. It won't know how to rank us. The only thing we should want the world to know is that it wants whatever it is that we have. But if we're truly meek, we know that that's not something we can give them. It's not even something we have come up with on our own. We can't make ourselves meek. We don't have the capacity. Nothing but the Holy Spirit can humble us. Nothing but the friendship of God can make us poor in spirit, make us mourn because of our sinfulness, and produce in us this true, right view of self and give us this very mind of Christ himself to make us Jesus people. Again, from the message, here's what Jesus says on the subject. What I'm saying is this. If you walk around all high and mighty, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you'll become more than yourself. Number four, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. Or blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for what is right, they will be filled. We often think of righteousness as being personally pious, doing what is right, being right, making ourselves right. The idea of righteousness finds its root in the covenant God made with Abraham. It means doing right by the other person in the covenant agreement to fulfill your half of the arrangement. And when we're in contract or covenant with God, you can guess who sets the standard. So right is that which aligns with God's character. If it doesn't align with God's character, it's wrong. That reminds us of the early notion that sin is anything that God wouldn't do. So hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we overlay that with the message of the gospel, one can make the argument that righteousness is more than being right. If we understand it that way, there are other dimensions to righteousness. Professor Carl Ellis explains it like this. 
Righteousness has four dimensions. Piety, doing what is right according to God in a narrow sense that involves devotion and ceremony. Live in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. But then second, justice, doing what is right toward your fellow image bearers. In James it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The third dimension is personal, living rightly before God as an individual. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, dedicated to God and pleasing Him. And then finally, social, living rightly before God as a corporate community, namely as the body of Christ, where we carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We're inclined to reject righteousness out of hand because of the negative connotation associated with self-righteousness. But there's a major yet subtle difference between being righteous and being self-righteous. Righteousness identifies and hungers for what is right, the truth of it. Self-righteousness says, I am right. If you don't agree with me or if you don't do what I'm doing, you're wrong. That can get ugly and fast. It was the self-righteousness in some religious leaders that caused both Jesus and his cousin John to call those religious leaders a brood of vipers or a family of serpents, Satan's spawn. It's understandable why we'd want to steer clear of the self-righteous thing. But that's not the message. The message is just righteousness and that those who hunger and thirst for it will be filled. I'm currently watching a documentary from Steven Spielberg on the last days of World War II. It's actually called The Last Days. At that point in the war, Hitler had already resigned himself to losing the war. But rather than spooling down all of his operations, he accelerated his efforts to eliminate all the Jews from Europe. There's footage of U.S. troops liberating concentration camps like Dachau. To watch these emaciated prisoners shuffling about, unable to even process what was happening, but then seeing their reaction to wagons of potatoes, it's easy to get a portrait of abject hunger. I felt like I've been hungry, like hungry hungry, maybe five times in my life. I've been bored hungry a lot. I've been hangry quite a bit. But the kind of hungry that hurts, the kind of hungry that makes you forget about everything else, the kind of hungry that makes you lose your mind a little bit, I don't think I've ever really known that hunger. And I know that that kind of hunger and thirst exists in our world, even in our community, and it breaks my heart. I, I hope it breaks yours too. But it's that kind of hunger and thirst that we should feel for righteousness. We should want it so much to be like God, in the image of God, and with the character of God, having the heart of God, that it hurts when we don't have it. It should make us forget about everything else. The hunger and thirst for this righteousness should make us lose our mind a little bit. So let's rephrase the beatitude. Happy are those who so badly want to be more like Jesus that they lose their minds a little bit. When they do that, they will find what they're looking for and be filled. The ways of the world tell us never to lose our minds a little bit. Don't be weird. Don't make a scene. Don't stand out. Mind your own business. Stay in your lane. Cover your butt. Take care of number one. Gross. First, I'm not number one. The moment I chose Jesus, the moment that you chose Jesus, we made him number one. I want to become more like him. Cover my butt? Nah. I want to be the sort of person that has my neighbor's back. That's what Jesus would do. Stay in my lane? Mind my own business? Well, I specifically bought a, I bought a car that autonomously keeps me in my lane, so it's not like that's a personal strength of mine. More than that, I'm called to be about my father's business, not my own business, pursuing his character and purpose, not my own. Don't stand out. Don't make a scene. Don't be weird. Do you even know me? <laughs> I spent a lifetime being weird for weird sake rat tails and earrings, mismatched shoes and tattoos. But since I've come to understand this pursuit, the righteousness of God, I'm going to be weird for Jesus, you guys. I'm going to say stuff and do stuff and be stuff that is weird to the world, but pretty cool with Jesus. In this world, in his culture, among his peers, Jesus was weird. Always talking upside down, operating outside the, the bounds of religious norms, doing the unexpected, loving recklessly, but deliberately making friends with those he shouldn't, and pointing to God the Father the entire time. That's what I want. I want to be like Jesus, weird like Jesus, like the guy who gave up the glory and sanctity of heaven for a broken personhood in a broken world, unrelenting and positive obedience to God's holy law and will, his reaction to other people in kindness, compassion, empathy, and sensitivity, his reaction to his enemies, 
He fed and kissed Judas, right? He healed the soldier's ear. And for me, and here's the magic part, the more I try to be like him, the more I hunger and thirst for it. I'm rewarded with happiness and blessing and fruitfulness, and those rewards make me hunger and thirst for even more. And when I'm rewarded more, so I'm hungry more. That's the gospel, you guys. That's the Jesus journey. A Jesus person is one who at one and the same time is hungering and thirsting, and yet they are filled. And the more they are filled, the more they hunger and thirst. This is the blessedness of the Christian life. So our four steps in becoming Jesus people looks like this. One, we have to empty ourselves of every notion of pride, self-reliance, and self-absorption. God's got no room to work in a spirit that's full of themselves. Two, we have to mourn and hate the fact that we sin and that we're sinners until we're ready to commit to the process of being convicted of, repenting of, and hating our ongoing sin. We're inflexible and effectively useless to God. Number three, we have to think of ourselves less than we do. Not think less of ourselves, but we have to put God, Jesus, and the kingdom first. And that looks like putting others and the good ahead of our own pursuits and desires. Lastly, we want to be right and do right by God so badly that it hurts. That hunger should consume us. Everything we do, our family, our work, our friendships, our faith community should be served by our pursuit to be more like Jesus. We all want to be happy. The world is bent on it. No matter what it costs or how long it will last, we want to be happy. It's the great motive behind every act and ambition behind all work and striving and all effort. Everything in this world is designed for happiness. But the great tragedy is that happiness is so fleeting, so vaporous, that it can't be grasped. It's like grabbing water or catching smoke. So while the world is sought out to find happiness, it never seems to be able to find it. Is that you? Do you feel like no matter how much you try, how much effort you put out, how many promotions you have, how much you believe in your abilities, you just can't be satisfied? You're not alone, friend. That's everybody, literally everybody. But the most wonderful news in the world is that you can't achieve or accumulate happiness not on your own. You need Jesus. People all over the world and all through the ages of time have spent countless coin and endless effort to find the thing Jesus offers for free and in a single moment. Blessed relief, complete fulfillment, never ending joy. And it's yours for the asking. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? The Bible says that if, if you say that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's it. No classes, no fees, no probationary period. Salvation is yours. And with that comes a relationship and the friendship that makes life worth living. And the light and the refuge and the strength that can help you overcome your fears will be yours. If that's you, would you repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I believe you are Lord. I believe you died for me and that God raised you from the dead. Come into my life. Overcome my fears. Be my strength. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In your holy name, amen. That's it. If you prayed that prayer and mean it with all your heart, God has forgiven your sins and you are born again in his spirit. All of heaven is rejoicing and we're excited to take this journey of faith with you. If you could let us know about your encounter with Jesus today by logging on to jesus.lifechurchgreenbay.com and share your information with us, we'll follow up with you and we'll be on this thing together. But before we go, you might be saying, look, I know Jesus is my friend, my Lord, and my Savior, but I haven't really relinquished my hold on my life. I can't say that I've emptied myself of my pride. There's things I'm doing that I'm not particularly ready to give up. I think of myself first before God, before His will, and before His commandments. I don't necessarily hunger and thirst to be more like Jesus. If that's you, let me pray. God, please reveal your heart to my friends. Make it plain to them the benefits and rewards and blessings of a life completely sold out for you and that it's so much more than fulfilling than being sold out for the world and the world's pursuits. Lord, remind them that while we will never be able to completely live up to your character and your nature, trying to do so could be the most gratifying life we could ever hope for this side of heaven. God, put a hunger and thirst for your righteousness in each one of us, I pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Never forget how much God loves you.